with Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to GabFest Reads for the month of March. I'm Emily Bazelon, one of the co-hosts of Slate Political GabFest. I am here today with Tana French. Hi, Tana. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited that you're here. So fans of Tana French, me among them, hold their breath for the moment when a new Tana French novel appears. And we are here to talk about The Hunter, which is Tana's ninth book. This is a book that delivers all of the pleasures, I think, that Tana French is known for. It's a suspense novel. It has a detective story at the heart that is a page turner. It has memorable characters. Cal Hooper and Trey Reddy are back from Tana's last book, uh, The Searcher. And also returning are the village and community of farms and mountain dwellings of Ardna Kelty in Western Ireland. In many of your novels, Tana, there's a social issue of our times that's kind of in the background. It's not pushing the narrative forward, but it's affecting what happens and how the characters are feeling. And I think this time the issue that at least leaped out to me was climate change, um, because there is a very hot summer happening um, as the story unfolds. And this is the second novel you've written about Cal Hooper, who is a former cop from Chicago, and he moved to the Irish countryside in search of a kind of escape from Chicago, but the community he found is not an idyllic one. Um, I really like how it is portrayed in all of its uh, sometimes Machiavellian complexity. So you live in Dublin, I know, and you are best known for several books you wrote about the city's murder squad. Why did you decide to move your setting and your action to um, this village of Ardna Kelty, a very different setting than Dublin? What happened was I suddenly discovered the Western genre a few years back. Somehow I'd never read any Westerns. They just didn't sound like my kind of thing. And then someone whose taste I trust said to me, you have got to read Lonesome Dove. So I went, okay. And I did. And I loved it. It's an amazing book. And I read others. I read, you know, True Grit and on a more modern note, uh, The Sisters Brothers. And I thought they were amazing. And they had so many tropes in them that I thought would fit really well onto the west of Ireland. Like there's a lot in common between the settings. They've both got that sort of harsh beauty that is going to demand both physical and mental toughness from anyone who's trying to make a living out of it. And they've got that sense of somewhere that's really far removed from the centres of power, not just geographically, but culturally as well. So that the people who are living there feel like the power brokers don't really care about them and don't understand them. And if they want a society that's going to be cohesive and functional, they're going to have to make their own rules and enforce them themselves. And I thought that's the Western, but it also shows up a lot in drama about the West of Ireland. And I started thinking about how certain Western tropes would map onto the West of Ireland. And in the searcher, I was going for, you know, the stranger who rolls into town and maybe he's got a bit of a past, maybe he doesn't, but either way, he's going to turn into a catalyst. He's going to catalyze change in the small town, whether he wants to or not. But in The Hunter, I was thinking about a different set of tropes. I just felt like there were more things in that genre crossover that I hadn't played with yet and that I wanted to. I was thinking about, like, Trey's absent father who in The Searcher just has vanished off to London or somewhere like that. I thought, what would it do to Cal and Trey's sort of budding relationship that hasn't really solidified yet if he came back, if he showed up? And he seemed like the type of guy who would only come home, Johnny Reddy, the absent father, if he had a get-rich-quick scheme, if he had something to bring that would make him the hero and that would make him money. And I started thinking about the gold rush trope that shows up in so many Westerns. You know, there's gold in them, there are hills. And weirdly enough, it doesn't sound like Ireland would be the kind of place where a gold rush would fit in, but it sort of does. Because when Johnny says there are all these ancient gold artifacts that have been found in Ireland, there really are. Those really are just huge numbers of them in the National Museum. 
And there have been little gold rushes over the centuries, right up until now. You still get companies finding a seam of gold somewhere in the mountains and try to capitalize on it. So I thought, well, what if Johnny comes home with a plan to find gold in them there hills and took it from there? You know, one of the things that I love about the gold rush part of the story is that it makes the book feel old and new at the same time. Like there are a lot of cultural references to right now, to the internet, you know, to Instagram. We know that it's now, but because they're looking for gold, which yes, evokes, you know, the 19th century in California and people panning in the river, you even have them out there in a river in one scene. It feels sort of timeless. And I wonder if that is also one of the appeals of this village setting, that it's in the modern world, but it's also kind of apart in some way as well. Well, it's one of the things I like about the West of Ireland where it, it is modern. Like these are not like old fashioned people stuck driving horses and carriages, but it's very deeply rooted. You know, you get people on land that their ancestors have farmed for as far back as anyone can remember. You have reminders of the past everywhere. You have little famine cottages popping up all over the landscape that were abandoned in the 1860s during the Great Famine, and they've just been left to tumble down and to have nature take them back. So there are reminders of the past. It's very much present. The divide isn't as solid and final as it can sometimes feel in cities. It's The layers are very intertwined and very present at the same time. So one of the things that has always stood out to me about some of your previous books about the Dublin Murder Squad was that you would tell a whole book, I think in the first person, from the vantage point of one cop, and then you would switch over to someone who was kind of a secondary character, maybe not even someone we liked very much, who was another figure in the Murder Squad, and we would see the same world but from this tilted perspective. This book is your second book from the perspective of Cal Hooper, uh, this ex-cop from Chicago. You're writing in the kind of close third person, but there are some scenes that take place like we're in Trey Reddy's mind, um, this, I think, 15-year-old kid who Cal has gotten really close with. I just wondered how you think about the first person and the third person and whether we might someday have a book about Arden Kelty from Trey Reddy's perspective or the perspective of someone else in the town um, who's seems unlikely right now. The first third person thing first, right, to talk about that bit first. When I was thinking about this Western thing, one of the reasons I liked it was I was just coming off writing The Witch Elm, where basically the main locus of the action was inside the main character's head. It was very much a first person book because where all the conflict and development was happening was inside this character's mind. It was hugely introspective. And I had had enough of that with the at the, by the end of writing that book, I got to the point where I was like, oh my God, this guy needs to pull his head out, go out and do something. And Westerns are very much about people who do things. They don't tend to focus the main action within anybody's head. It tends to be about the things people do, not the things they think. And they tend to be about people who prioritize action over thought in terms of importance. So Cal turned out to be like that. I wanted a, a narrator very much like that, well, a narrator, a POV character, who was somebody who believed that you're defined not by your thoughts, but by what you do, by your actions. And that kind of necessitated third person. Because if you write first person, what you're saying is, it is crucial for you, the reader, to be inside this character's mind. Their mind matters, their thought processes matter. And the ways they lie to themselves are crucially important. It's all that intricacy within the mind that matters. But by writing third person, even close third person, you're saying you don't actually need to be inside this person's head. That's not where the important stuff is happening. The important stuff is what the person does. And so if I'm writing someone like Cal, who really prioritizes what he does over what he thinks or says, then I've got to be writing third person because that's the only way that the structure of the book can match the character it's about. One of the special things about these two books of yours, I think, is how you are so close to two characters. I feel like Trey Reddy is really um, fully realized. Uh, it was true in the 
the searcher, but it becomes even more true in this book. And in some ways, I mean, you're right. Cal's not introspective. That's not what he's about. Trey sort of resists being introspective, but yeah. actually yep. has a lot of like really interesting thoughts about the community he's living in, about his family, about wait, I'm calling him a boy. He's a girl, which is sort of deliberate on your part. Um, yeah, she yeah. wouldn't care. <laughs> she wouldn't care. I don't think she would mind. But yeah, she uh, has a lot of thoughts about her family and the world that she's living in. And I wonder, you know, it's hard sometimes to write from an adolescent point of view. And were you very conscious of having this second voice uh, who's speaking to us from inside her own head? I loved writing Trey. I loved this time that I got a chance to write from her perspective, even if, you know, not first person, but still it is very much her perspective. Because the thing about her, yes, writing adolescence is tough, but it's tough because they're at such a transition point. And Trey's 15, and that's a huge moment of transition from that kind of childish viewpoint where you see things very much in black and white. You have one goal and you're consumed by it. There is no room for nuance and layering and complexity. She's transitioning from that to a more mature adult viewpoint where things are more layered, things are more complicated. There may not be a right answer. And I love writing that. I love writing people in transition, partly because you're very vulnerable at a moment like that. And Trey is, in fact, vulnerable. But she doesn't know that because she's 15. She's invincible. She only sees what she wants. But Cal and Lena see that. So the refracting of what Trey thinks back to Cal, back to Lena, what they think about that, how those impulses she has bounce back and forth between the characters, I really loved writing. And I also really loved writing her impatience with the adult way of looking at things. Adults are there going, well, you have to think about the long-term consequences. And in this, is this really morally what you want to get into? And she's like, oh, for God's sake, I want revenge. I deserve revenge. I have a chance for revenge. Leave me alone. And that's a lot of fun to write because as an adult, as a grown-up, it's been decades since I had a chance to think like that. And so it was kind of fun to have that chance again. And Lena, we should just say, is Cal's girlfriend, who's also yeah. like a longtime member of the community and um, very insightful and important uh, to, to Cal as a kind of anchor, but also for understanding Ardna Kelty and all the people in it. So your book, I assume, gets shelved um, as a kind of genre detective novel. But you're also obviously playing with all the boundaries of these genres. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a very literary book, as are other works of yours. I think of you as kind of delivering what we expect from a thriller in a very satisfying way, but then kind of using that to say lots of other things and um, write these deep characters. And I just wonder how this started for you. I mean, did you set out to write a detective, a suspense novel? Do you find the kind of genre confining or do you, is it just a good way for you to write books that people will actually buy and read? When I wrote In the Woods, my first one, I didn't think I was writing a mystery. I th thought I was just writing a book that was mystery shaped for practical reasons because structure is not my strong point, right? I'm fairly confident when I'm writing characters. I'm fairly confident with atmosphere, with, you know, writing on a sentence to sentence level. But when it comes to structure, I have had to work really, really hard to get cohesive structures that move forward and don't get bogged down because I get really into my characters and I would happily just write these people and keep writing until the book was a million words long. My deadline was years ago and I still didn't know where to stop. I know I'm, I like writing characters. Thing is though about mystery, it's a really good framework. It nails down a structure because A kills B and then C finds out who done it and then you can finish the book. So I started writing mist like in the woods in a mystery format, partly because I just love mysteries. I it, real ones, fictional ones, solved, unsolved, I don't care, I'm fascinated by them. And partly because it put a structure on it. It meant that the book had a, an automatic arc. Everything had to drive towards an endpoint. And when the endpoint had happened, I would know that it was probably time to finish the book. And I've stuck with it for those reasons, but I, I really don't find the genre confining. I think there are still people 
who believe in this dichotomy that, you know, literary fiction, it's got great themes, great writing, but probably not a lot of plot. And genre fiction has got a gripping plot, but probably not a lot of characterization and just workmanlike writing. But the people who believe in that are in the minority now. Most people are going, well, I can try and do it all. I can try and take the bits that I want from all the different genres, mix them up and see what I got get in the end. And I kind of see the mystery conventions as a starting point rather than as a bunch of boundary walls that I have to stay within. Because the mystery genre, right, it's been going for a long time now. And those conventions have been polished to an absolute shine by people who came before me. You know, you've got the golden age writers, the Agatha Christie's, you've got people who have really done working within the conventions so beautifully that I almost feel like there's not much point in me trying to do that because I'm not going to do it better than Agatha Christie. So the next step is to play with those conventions, take them as a springboard and a starting point and see, well, what can I stretch? What can I bring in from elsewhere? What can I deliberately ignore or subvert? And where's that going to get me? And it is a lot of fun. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, believe it by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, John Favreau here. There's no shortage of political takes in 2024, but quantity doesn't cut it. We need a better conversation about the latest biggest election of our lives. On Pod Save America, me and my co-host cut through the noise to help you figure out what matters and how you can help. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, Pod Save America is breaking down the political news that makes us laugh, cry, and snap our laptops in half. Expensive year for laptops. Make sure to check out new episodes of Pod Save America on your favorite podcast platform or our YouTube channel now. Do you think ahead of time about whether there's a particular social issue, uh, a kind of pending crisis that you want to include in the background? I mean, I'm thinking of like housing and overdevelopment, which is a big theme in one of your previous books. And then, you know, I really did feel like the hot weather was almost a character in this new story. And it, because it's having a real effect on the farmers and changing whether they can continue making a livelihood, it feels like it has something to say about climate change. I was wondering if that is something that sort of happens organically as you're working, or did you incorporate that from the beginning deliberately? No, I didn't. Like, it wasn't a deliberate thing about climate change at all. It was just me going, I need something in the air that feels like an unnatural pressure. And realizing that a heat wave, which is pretty unnatural for the west of Ireland, would not only do that, but would drive the plot. Because as you say, it's got a very concrete impact for these farmers. It's not like me who can go, yeah, it's hot, let's go to the beach for the day. For them, this threatens their livelihood. And it's what makes them so vulnerable to someone coming in with a get-rich-quick idea. So it's a, it is a factor in the plot. But I, I kind of feel like 
mystery is one of the genres that automatically is prone to tapping into major social issues. Because, okay, while you get murder in every society, it happens for very different reasons, depending on time and place. Like, if you get a murder over a piece of land, for example, you know that you're in a society where land matters, land ownership matters so deeply that someone is willing to kill for it. You're not going to get that in a nomadic tribe somewhere because this just isn't a huge societal priority. But you could get it down the west of Ireland where land matters at a just a bone deep level. So murder mysteries are automatically geared to tell you something about the society they're in. They're automatically some kind of barometer about that society's priorities, its fears, its hidden places, its darknesses. And so I I end up bringing in social issues without ever meaning to, just because they're in the background and they're shaping what a murder mystery can be about in this time and place. They automatically seep in. You were born in Vermont and you grew up all over the world and then moved to Ireland. I think you moved to Dublin for college. Do you consider yourself to be writing with the perspective of a kind of outsider or do you feel like you have an insider? Is Ireland the kind of place where you can ever be an insider if you weren't born and raised there? I'm never going to be an insider the way, you know, my husband is from Dublin, like generations back, probably as far back as the Vikings. I'm never going to be that. But I think in some ways, I'm sort of in the ideal position, because after 33 years here, I'm not an outsider, exactly, even though I'm not an insider. But that means that because I'm not an insider, I notice things that people will take for granted if they've been from here forever. Little cultural conventions, little, you know, the way the sense of humor operates, the nuance in the way you slag somebody depending on whether you like them or don't like them or are annoyed with them or want to get a message to, there are tiny nuances. And if you grow up with them, you tend to take them for granted. But if you're like me, what they call a third culture kid, sort of moving around the whole time, you have to get very attuned to those so that when you go to yet another new place, you're not going to stick your foot in your mouth and you're not going to inadvertently insult somebody or say something incredibly stupid, you tune into how cultural conventions work. And I've been here long enough and I'm enough of an insider that I've seen all those cultural conventions in action, but I'm still enough of an outsider that I notice them, I clock them. And that's pretty useful for a writer because it means that you're aware of them enough that you can incorporate them into the books you write. And also that you know that your readers might not take them for granted any more than you do. So you're not, you don't place that expectation on your readers that they should automatically know all this stuff. You're bringing them in rather than assuming they're already in. That all makes so much sense. I uh, confess, I was very surprised to learn that you're not native um, Irish because I think of the way you write dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue in your books, which is hard to do naturally and well. And it's really inflected with a lot of Irish speech patterns. I often find myself wanting to speak in this way with phrases like, (laughs) you know, flair, fair play to you, things that I would just never say because I'm not Irish, it would be dumb. But (laughs) I wonder if um, this is also a way in which one might assume that you can only write dialogue like that if you've been steeped in it from childhood, but that actually the phrases that you notice, you're noticing in part because they're a little different from what you grew up with. Yeah, I think so. I think that that's exactly why I'm picking them up is because I haven't been hearing this since I was born. I I I appreciate it that little bit more. Like things like the Irish talent for creative insult, man, there is nothing like it. And I adore it. And I clock every single brilliant creative insult I hear. I heard somebody say, not long ago, oh man, him, he's got a face on him like a melted welly. I am going to have to use that somewhere. (laughs) It's just beautiful. And I think if you were from here, yeah, you might take that for granted and let it slip by you. So you've, I think, become an enormously successful best-selling writer, I assume. Obviously, when you turned in your first book, that was not the case because it was your first book. Uh, And I imagine that it kind of took a little while for your reputation to grow. Do you find that um, your process is different now? Are you edited differently now that you're such an enormous presence in the publishing world? I sometimes worry that writers don't get edited anymore and actually everybody needs an editor, but I don't, I haven't noticed a real change in your book. So I wonder about that aspect of your process. 
man, I am so glad you said that because I am with you all the way. Everyone needs an editor. It doesn't matter how experienced you are. That second pair of eyes is amazing. And a skilled editor is doing something that you just can't do. They're seeing what you want the book to be, and they're seeing what you need to do to take it that extra step in that direction. And I've been so lucky. I've had amazing editors the whole way. And my editor now, she does. She sees the book in a way that I'm not capable of. She is seeing some holistic version of it that I can't see because I've been steeped in the thing for two years by the time she sees it. And she's seeing what I want it to be that I didn't even realize myself. So I hope I will always be edited and will always appreciate the heck out of editors. Yeah, there must be something you must have to continue to telegraph how open you are to it when you become a bigger presence in the publishing world, because otherwise people might start right if you sort of signaled, I don't really care about this anymore. It might be harder for your editor to insist now than with your first book. I wonder. I don't know. I haven't tried. I mean, my editor knows, <laughs> all my editors know that I think they're basically geniuses and could not do this without them. So I hope they take that to me. Yes, please keep editing me, please. I also think it takes a lot longer than this to really know what you're doing as a writer. Like I've been writing books for 20 years now, but I see so many writers who their best work only comes in their 50s, their 60s, even into their 70s. Look, at, I mean, Cormac McCarthy was what, he was 73 when The Road came out? So even like after 20 years, I feel like I'm only just starting to get the hang of this. So God knows I need an editor as I keep trying to figure out how this works. One thing that surprises me about your work is that it has not been the subject of a huge number of movies. I When I went and looked yesterday, I found one TV series that was based on your first two books combined, which I need to go watch because I can't totally imagine how that would work. Is this something that you're interested in doing or, or could we expect? It just seems like such a great body of work for some uh, director or production company to tap into. Thank you. I am, um, I, I, okay, I haven't actually seen the series that was based on the first two because I was initially supposed to be kind of involved, but that was because I thought I was under the impression that they wanted to do an adaptation of the books. And it turned out what they wanted to do was something that was kind of loosely inspired by the books, by a few plot points here, a few characters there. And I just went, man, you don't want me involved in this. I'm just going to be sitting there going, eh, excuse me, that's not like it was in the books. And <laughs> nobody needs that. Everyone's just going to wind up stressed and annoyed at each other. So I went, no, no, you do your thing. You've got a great cast. You cannot go too far wrong. So since then, though, I've been going, I don't know really what I think about the idea of a film. I would love it if it was somebody who was in tune, almost like an editor, who had that ability to see more in the books than I've seen myself. Like the ultimate adaptation for me is Greta Gerwig's Little Women. The what she did with that book, I had read it as a kid, of course I had, everybody has, but she illuminated it for me on levels that I had never seen it before. She brought out all these resonances, all these just thematic underpinnings to it. I see that book completely differently. And I thought that was just an incredible adaptation. And I would love to see somebody do that with one of my books. I'd love to see some director go, I'm seeing the things in here that you haven't even seen, and I'm going to illuminate them. That's the kind of adaptation I'd love. <laughs> well, I am no movie director, but I put that challenge out there for someone <laughs> because somebody should do this and uh, the world will come and see those movies. Tana French, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been so fun to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been great. Tana French is the author of the new book, The Hunter. That's it for this month's edition of GabFest Read. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. And Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GabFest Reads. And until then, all three of us, David and John and me, will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of Slate Political GabFest. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. 
No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.